kind of an unfortunate uh, semester because we didn't get to spend much time together in class and because the fish room is really tight and whatnot, we didn't get to do a whole lot of work with uh, clownfish and raising coral. Um, so that that's just kind of unfortunate, I guess. And right now I don't actually have any uh, baby clownfish going, but uh, the waves, tides and coasts, the material from that will be like on the final, we're gonna have a final exam. So if we, if we come back in person, it'll be in person. Otherwise, it's going to be online. I don't know what the future holds for uh, us being in school and whatnot. But there's another folder here that says book biological oceanography. And the part about the lionfish uh, was kind of like the relationship between how the lionfish live near the coast and how the currents can carry the lionfish and the water's got to be just right and whatnot. But there are also other types of fish and other types of animals and plants and whatnot that live in the ocean. And... Uh, like there's lots of different kinds of sea creatures like marine mammals, including whales and seals and uh, walruses and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, but we'll look at stuff with the coral reefs because they happen to be near coastal areas as well. So there's this, uh, in the biological oceanography, I put a link, this is for a thing that says clownfish life cycle. And uh, you can see the pictures in that I'm actually gonna download a copy so we can watch it offline. And it's kind of big, so it's probably best to view it inline because uh, I forget how many megabytes it's gonna turn out to be. But the pictures are all like relatively high resolution pictures. So uh, maybe we'll just view it inline. Yeah, we'll just view it inline. Oops, somebody else is coming in. Okay, so... Um, you know, the movie Finding Nemo uh, talked a lot or dealt a lot with clownfish and like clownfish behavior and whatnot, which was kind of cute. And clownfish are ubiquitous fish that live in aquariums. And when it comes to having saltwater aquariums, it's really common to have clownfish. They're relatively easy to keep. Uh, they have a cool commensurate uh, relationship that they form with anemones. So clownfish are also called anemone fish because the clownfish live within the tentacles of the anemone. If you've ever spent like much time or gone in and out of the uh, aquarium in the library, the library has some huge um, anemones. They're called Sherman's Rose Bubble Tip Anemones. And they're actually like relatively highly prized in the hobby. Uh, we propagate them here or split them. And then we offer them for sale. And that's how we make some money for the school. Um, these are a pair of our uh, Osolaris clownfish that we used to have. Like they have a lifespan, so they... They pass away from time to time. But this was a pair that we had for about 10 years. Or, uh, like I had them I had them for about 10 years and they live to be about 10 years old, although clownfish can live longer. Uh, they form a commensurate relationship with anemones. And so how it goes is like anemones are animals and but they're sessile animals. They can't move around. They uh, get energy from the sun, but uh, they also um, use nematocysts, which are stinging cells to eat uh, food that happens to be in the water. So it turns out that anemones will eat fish. They'll they'll eat an entire fish. And all fish know to stay away from anemones, except clownfish not only do not get eaten by anemones, the anemones know not to eat the clownfish, and the clownfish build like a resistance or tolerance to um, the anemones themselves. It's not exactly clear how that happens. Uh, what we do observe is that when clownfish are young and first go to an anemone, it looks as if it's like painful or stingy or they have to get used to it. But um, I've even attempted to feed dead clownfish that have never been in a tank with anemones to an anemone and the anemone won't take it. The anemone knows that it's a clownfish. Uh, it's pretty surprising how that happens. And the other fish that we have in the aquariums, when they die, we feed them to the anemones. It's like the circle of life. So the clownfish live within the tentacles of the anemones. And that helps the clownfish. It offers protection for the clownfish. Because the clownfish are like, yo, I get to live in the anemones' uh, tentacles. And that's like my home. And any other fish that comes to try to eat me, uh, it's out of luck because I'm hiding in here. And oftentimes the color of the clownfish is close to the color of the anemone itself. And they've got those like white and black stripes, which kind of give it good camouflage. 
what the anemone gets in return is that clownfish are like filthy eaters. Uh, they'll, they eat uh, messily, they'll poop in the anemone. Um, the clownfish sometimes will have excessive food available. They'll just straight up feed the anemones and then they lay their eggs at the base of an anemone. So it's a pretty remarkable relationship. A pair of clowns will live for about 10 years and clownfish, they pair bond for life. So like a pair of clownfish uh, will bond and they will uh, spawn or mate together um, in this monogamous relationship for life, which is a pretty remarkable relationship when it comes to fish. They help uh, rear the babies and uh, take turns going out to get food, take turns watching for the babies and whatnot. And the movie Finding Nemo, they kind of show like there's uh, Nemo's uh, dad, Marlon, and his mom, and Ty, and whatnot. But the, the parents, they don't really raise the babies once the babies are hatched, but they care for the eggs until they are hatched. Um, our clownfish here at school, and typically they will lay about a thousand eggs in a clutch and they can do it about every 14 days. We have one pair that got down to every 12 days. So over the course of uh, the life of a clownfish, a typical um, sexual maturity period is about eight years. A pair of clownfish can have about 200,000 babies in eight years, which is a remarkable number, but nearly all of them don't survive. Some of the larvae get eaten by the anemone as soon as they're born. Um, and they're good food. So like the way it works in the ocean is little fish are get eaten by bigger fish and bigger fish get eaten by even bigger fish. So many, many, many fish that are uh, born in the ocean don't make it. And in the movie Funny Nemo, if uh, you know Nemo is like a baby that survives, that's one out of the entire clutch of maybe a thousand eggs. Some clutches can be even bigger than a thousand eggs. So um, our pairs of clownfish once they're uh, old enough to pair up, it's usually about a year or so, will begin to form a relationship and the female will begin laying clutches of eggs on surfaces. And usually in aquariums, they'll lay them on the glass. Uh, and I'll show you like how that little process takes place. But what I try to do and what other people who raise clownfish try to do is train them to lay their eggs on a particular surface. So this pair of clownfish lived in this tank. It's a 40 gallon tank. We had this pair and they produced um, dozens of clutches of eggs, groups of eggs that we sold. But uh, this pair of clownfish would always lay their eggs on the side of the glass over here. And so then what we did, what I do is they get used to laying their eggs over and over and over again on the same piece of glass. But there's a reason why we don't want them to lay the eggs on the glass. So instead, you take a ceramic tile. They also like laying eggs on the backside of ceramic tiles, like ceramic tiles that are used for like floors and walls and kitchens and stuff like that. Because um, the surface is just about the same as uh, calcium carbonate or limestone rock in the ocean. So what you do is they lay their eggs over and over and over again at the same place. And then if you put a tile in at the same place, they're used to laying it in that location, but now they've laid the eggs on the tile. So we try to get them to lay their eggs on the tile and when they lay the eggs, they look like little orange dots. So this is a uh, called a percola clownfish, which is the kind of clownfish that Nemo is. And these are all uh, eggs that have been laid uh, by the female, which is a pretty remarkable thing. Let me actually go and show you where you want to see videos. So in the biologic oceanography, which is labeled as current unit, there's a link that says plan for the week. And in this plan for the week, there's a whole list of videos. I'm not going to show all these here now, um, but they're better to see uh, if you view them instead of watching them through the Zoom. But this very first one here says, Osler is preparing to spawn, including spin dance, um, is kind of remarkable. So these are all videos that I've made. They're all clownfish that we've raised here at school. So this is a pair of clownfish, the one that's uh, in the foreground and toward the top, that's the female, and the female is always larger. And then the male is the smaller one, and he's toward the back. And when you watch this in real time on YouTube, you'll see that uh, there's a behavior that the males exhibit just before spawning takes place called the spin dance. And you might be able to see, even see it here. It almost looks like a dog chasing its tail. 
but the mail will spin repeatedly, It'll spin clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise. And, uh, you know, he knows that the female is ready to lay eggs because she is releasing hormones into the water that he can, uh, like, detect, like, smell or taste. And it's getting very close to spawning. So this behavior of catching the spin dance is quite rare because they only do it for a little while. And then you see the male here is actually cleaning the site where they lay the eggs. So the, the site where they lay the eggs has to be free of algae and uh, parasites and stuff like that. So he's like, you know, picking that stuff off the surface. And then, um, so that's a, that's a pretty cool <clears throat> thing to be able to witness and see. And I've caught that on video a couple times. And this is actually a really good example of it. And that's the exact same pair that I showed in that picture with the same ceramic tile in that tank. And they laid pairs of eggs on that tile in that location over and over and over again. I could consistently get them every 12 days, get a clutch of eggs numbering between 600 and 1,000, which is quite a lot. That's a lot of baby fish. So um, once, uh, so like it's usually in the afternoon, then the uh, eggs are actually laid. And the second video that says, uh, it says like spawning, Osolaris slow-mo spawning is this video and you can actually see some of the eggs on the surface it was that orange surface that's here in the video so what happens is uh the female has this thing called ovipositor uh ova for egg and positor like a depositor uh, which is like a tube on the lower side of the fish on the ventral side of the fish and here she goes she goes up to the surface and with the ovipositor starts sticking the eggs onto the surface and there's like a glue, like an adhesive that is produced by the female. And those eggs are stuck right onto the surface. Um, and they're usually stuck together like in rows. And then the male comes by and uh, fertilizes the eggs. It's like external fertilization. And um, so that's the egg laying external fertilization. They take turns. She lays eggs, he fertilizes them. He lays eggs, he fertilizes them. And it takes like, you know, maybe like an hour or so and they get them all done. They lay them on the surface. So uh, those two videos are there and they're kind of neat. Um, once the eggs are laid on the surface, so this is a good uh, photograph showing the individual eggs and she's laid them both on this vertical and this horizontal surface. Uh, that's probably about 500 eggs. It's like a kind of a moderate size clutch. And when they're first laid, they're like a bright orange color. And that's pretty cool. Um, and then those eggs begin to develop. And it only takes about a week for them to fully develop. This is a day-wise development of the embryos. So there's uh, the egg sac, which is this transparent case, and the uh, uh, fertilized eggs. Fertilized egg begins to uh, develop. And even by the third day, you can see the, uh, the shape of the body of the fish. This is the yolk sac. The eyes begin to appear about the third and fourth day. And then the fish is kind of folded up inside this egg sac. And then all of a sudden it'll hatch. Uh, it hatches by breaking out of the egg sac. This thing at the base is that glue that's glued onto the surface of the, of the rock itself. So here's a picture of a pair of clownfish in a tank with that tile. So here's the deal about why you want them to lay on the tile. When those baby fish hatch, they are incredibly tiny. They're almost microscopic. And our filtration system for the aquariums will just take them out of the water. Uh, they'll get eaten by other, the babies will be eaten by anemones, eaten by other fish. The parents will even eat them because they're not that smart. Uh, so what you try to do is get the babies to hatch in an empty tank all by themselves. And the reason why you get them to lay their eggs on a ceramic tile is because then you can take that tile out of one tank and put it in another tank. So if they lay their eggs on a tile, what I do is then take that tile and the parents out of the tank and put them in a separate, bare, completely empty tank. And the parents tend to the eggs. And what, what that means to tend to the eggs is that they are constantly swimming back and forth across the eggs to keep them aerated. And they look for eggs that are not fertilized and eggs that are not developing correctly because those eggs will form mold and if the eggs get moldy, the mold will spread throughout the entire clutch of eggs and kill all the babies. So they have to constantly watch after and make sure that all the eggs that are developing correctly 
are uh, stay and all the bad eggs get picked off and then they actually just eat them which is kind of weird but that's what they do um this goes on for about six or seven days and then on hatch night the babies look like this this is a like close-up view you can see the yolk sac that's the orange part uh because it turns out their bodies are actually transparent and you get these silverish looking eyes so in the plan for the week uh i've got some other videos about that so here's a video of them tending their eggs and it's you know going to be better if you watch it like in real time uh but whenever they tend the eggs you'll see that the eggs will like wave back and forth as the fish swim across them uh they're always like checking them out making sure that they're all good this is actually like on hatch night because you can even see that they're like kind of shiny so there they go and the eggs kind of like wave back and forth and uh they're getting close to hatching so this waving back and forth thing is also an important thing that happens on hatch night because it turns out what happens is uh uh one baby one of these embryos will decide it's time uh we don't know how which one decides but one embryo will break free from the egg case and when that happens uh there are hormones in that egg case that get released into the water and those hormones are then detected by other baby clowns and when one says it's time to go it uh signals all the other ones let's go and all within a very short period of time they all hatch or hatch off so it turns out that this hatching procedure um i'll show you a way that we like kind of make it happen but the clownfish always hatch just after dark because the deal is baby clownfish are good food for other fish and if you want to prevent from being eaten you want to be born at night and you want to be born as soon as after dark as possible so um basically like the sun goes down sun sets maybe like about an hour later that first one will decide to go um so once they begin to hatch they'll all hatch off so this video which is better in real time you'll see uh individual babies kind of like swimming around in the water you see babies swimming around in the water in the foreground but you'll also see ones hatching off the the blowing that's happening there is actually me i have a, like a turkey baster and i'm like squirting water at it and you'll see that they'll hatch in groups uh so as i as i kind of spray water toward them and some of them hatch away that also kind of delivers some of the hormone to the other ones and they'll all kind of break free from their egg case kind of wriggle out and break out and then they get up and swim around in the water and you'll see them swimming around in the water which is really cool um the the light is kind of orange here because most all of them have hatched and this is getting toward the end of the hatch and i'm trying to encourage the last ones but some of them just don't hatch because they just don't have enough energy they have to have enough energy in their yolk sac to be able to break free and if the parents didn't lay uh, energetic enough eggs some of them just don't hatch so these are the remainder ones that probably just won't hatch which is unfortunate so you know typically if i have 800 babies you, you know 700 will hatch maybe 100 of them don't but it's still a pretty good ratio and you know really good breeders who really feed their fish very high protein diets can get you know hatch rates like you know closer to 98 99% or so so that's the deal how i make them hatch on that night oh here's some other ones like on a rock is uh so it's kind of a bummer here at schools that cuz they always hatch at night they'll usually do it like you know i usually do it like 7:30 or so i intentionally leave all the lights on after school uh so that there is light and then i'll come back up to school and this black plastic garbage bag uh i put that big plastic big black garbage bag over the tank that has the baby fish in it and then i shut all the lights off in the room and then i just walk away and i wait i work in my room or you know whatever and about a half an hour later i go back and they'll all have hatched uh the that the 
that the um, bag goes over the top kind of signals them it's time to go. And then this aquarium here has hundreds, maybe 500 baby clownfish in it. And you can't see them in this picture because they are just absolutely super tiny. So on the first day and they're free swimming, they look like this. And we have to feed them live food called rotifers. And I'll show you about rotifers. They're kind of a uh, plankton uh, later on in the week, but we have to harvest or have to culture and harvest a uh, live food that is small enough that they can take in their mouths. These fish will only eat food that's in the water column that's moving and that's within about a body length of itself. So it's actually very challenging to keep them uh, feeding. And then uh, as the days go on, they start to develop pectoral fins and gill fins, but they still don't look like, um, you know, real clownfish yet. They look like a generic fish. And a lot of fish go through this larval stage where they're not really actually uh, clownfish yet. They're like a generic larva. Uh, they're usually kind of silverish in color. They're swimming up in the body of the water and they're not settled down onto the reef. It's about, uh, starting about the seventh day, the clownfish actually undergo a metamorphosis. The shape of the clownfish changes and they begin to develop the orange color and get the stripe. And it starts at their head and works the way to, toward the back. And it turns out that a lot of the fish well, some of the fish don't make it through this metamorphosis. It's a rapid and dramatic change in morphology or shape of their body. And uh, it's it, it, that process in our breeding, we call it the morph. And some people have a hard time getting them through the morph. Um, sometimes I'll have a clutch of eggs and maybe only half will make it through. Sometimes maybe more will make it through. But in the end, you get a big old group of baby clownfish. Uh, this is like one successful clutch. And that's a part of the tank with a whole bunch of the babies. So in the ocean, you know, out of a clutch of eggs, maybe one or two will survive for a few weeks. Most of them are eaten in a pretty short period of time. The other problem is clownfish live on reefs. So part of the issue becomes the, the eggs hatch on a reef in a place where they should live, but then currents and waves carry the fish away out into open water or to a place where it's not habitable. So even if they do survive that week or so and uh, make it through the morph in nature, they may not, um, may not be in a place that they could survive or they could live or find a partner. So once they get big enough, uh, put them in a tank with a whole bunch of oxygen, give them lots of air to breathe, and just keep pounding food into them. So uh, let me show you some other ones. These are videos of babies. The one that says newborn babies born on Pi Day. So these were born on uh, March 14th, 2017. And in this video, you can see little tiny like silver things kind of swimming around, but there's not, they're not very big at all. They kind of look like mosquito larvae. But when you also watch this video, you'll see what looks like some cloudiness in the water. And those little tiny specks, almost looking like dust, those are the rotifers, which are alive plankton that were feeding the babies. And they go around and eat those constantly. They eat them all day long. They just eat, 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 eat. And it turns out that in this tank where we raise them, I actually, how the tank is set up is there's, this is the uh, tile that they hatched off of. And I just leave it in there. There's a heater and there's an air stone and that's it. And then over here, there's a light. The light allows them to be able to see the babies and the fish are also attracted to the light. So I don't want the fish to be over here where the air stone is because when the babies get to the air stone, they get like picked up and pushed over and it's it can kill them. So I want them to stay over on this side of the tank. So I have a cover on this side, a light over here. They're attracted to the light and they'll stay over by the light. And I actually keep them awake for about the first week. We don't shut the light off for a week. They stay up 24 seven and just eat and just fill their bellies. That actually delays the metamorphosis by a day or two, but it gets them nice and fat. And it also prevents them from getting uh, like kind of too beat up by the air stone. And then uh, let's see, these are some other videos. So these are ones that are a week old 
you see them swimming around. They're kind of cute. So they're about a week and they have just begun metamorphosis. Uh, you'll see in the video that some of them are have some nice orange to them and are starting to get stripes. You may also notice in the, some of the tanks that there may be some that didn't make it that are down on the bottom. But in this video, you'll see some that are silver, some that are orange. They're undergoing that metamorphosis at about the one week period, which is pretty cool. And then once they are, let's see, I've got ones that are 18 days. So there they are after like 18 days. And now they're really looking like clownfish. Uh, they're swimming together. They stay together in a group. Um, always pointing the same way into the current. And uh, they got their nice orange and their nice white. And they'll eat as much as you can possibly feed them. So uh, in nature, clown, not many clownfish make it. But in captivity, you can get a pretty high rate. And what we try to do here at school is reduce the pressure on collecting clownfish from the ocean by breeding them in captivity. And uh, how the economics of it works is uh, if you capture clownfish from the ocean, I mean, you got to go to where they live. You got to get out on a boat. You got to dive for them. You're collecting adults uh, that have successfully made it. And then you've got to fly them to where they got to go. They got to go through a wholesaler. They got to go through a retailer. They finally end up in a tank. It's a pretty long process and it costs a lot of money to do that. And so the retail price for clownfish caught from the ocean is about 10 or $15. Uh, the clownfish that we raise in captivity, they don't cost us that much a piece to raise. And so typically the wholesale price for them or the price that breeders can get is about five bucks. And that's what I charge is five bucks. We can sell them all day long for $5. But um, if you're successful, I have a few friends. Uh, one friend of mine, he's just a full-time clownfish breeder. That's all that he does. And he makes really good money at it. Because uh, if you have a pair of clownfish that have, you know, that lay um, eggs every 12 days, if you can get, like here, I don't know, in this, this little video, there's probably like 150 of them. So you have like 150 uh, clownfish at $5 a piece. That's $750 of the clownfish. So every 12 days from one pair, you have $750 of the clownfish, which is pretty good money. <laughs> so there's money to be made. And there are a few breeders, uh, both independent breeders and companies that just breed uh, clownfish. The biggest company is called ORA. Uh, it's called Oceans, Reefs, and Aquariums. And this ORA farm. And they raise uh, clownfish, mandarin fish, all kinds of different fish and uh, offer them for sale. They're all captive bred, which means that they're raised in captivity. Now, typically clownfish just look like a regular clownfish like Nemo, like you'd expect. And on this site or a farm, they have some pretty weird looking ones. And we have some unusual clownfish here at school too. It turns out that uh, there's always natural variability. Whenever uh, fish are born, they can have different types of stripes, different types of coloration. And in the ocean, the coloration and the striping has to be just right for them to survive. Uh, the ones that the color is not right, they don't make it. So it's incredibly rare to find a fish in the ocean whose color isn't quite right. But in captivity, whenever you breed fish, once in a while, you'll get ones that, let me show you, for example, we have some odd ones. Okay, so like a regular Ocellaris clownfish looks like this one. But um, what happens is uh, some of them are born with stripes that aren't complete, and that's called a miss bar. So this is a miss bar Ocellaris clown. It, the stripe isn't complete. In the ocean, this fish wouldn't make it. It would be picked out. The coloration's not right. But if you breed this one along with another misbar, you get ones that are even more misbarred. And if you keep going through enough generations, you can end up with ones that are completely missing the white stripes altogether. So this is actually like captive bred. On the other hand, some of the fish that when they're born, the margin between the white and the orange, the black stripe is real thick. Uh, and if you keep breeding those ones with the real thick stripes against each other, 
and you keep going, you'll eventually get these fish that are completely black called midnight clownfish. So we have different types of clownfish here at school. I have probably, you know, 10 or 12 different types of what are called designer clownfish uh, that have different coloration. And whenever we uh, get these baby clownfish, we always look to pull out ones that are a little bit different uh, because people like ones that are just sort of different. It's kind of like how as humans, we've taken uh, wolves and bred them to be domesticated dogs. And we have this huge variety of domestic dogs, but they are all uh, essentially the same species of dog. It's not that like a Great Dane and a Chihuahua is a completely different species. They're, they're bred to be like that. Um, and it's arguable as the, I don't want to get into the whole dog breeding thing. The thing with the fish is simply differences in color, which doesn't affect them physiologically. Um, with dogs, you might know that specific certain types of dogs, they have physiological problems as a result of breeding different characteristics. Uh, these are these fish have the same shape or morphology and the same physiology and anatomy, but the coloration is just a little bit different. Uh, so that's how we do the clownfish. What I've also provided are some links to, let's see, I think that's the end of this. Yeah, so the clownfish life cycle is, goes right through here. So what turns out is, uh, and you can read about this online, I'll put some links to it, clownfish are, uh, when they're born, they're, they like have the capability of becoming male or female. And many people say that the default is male. Uh, whenever a pair of clownfish actually pairs up and pair bonds, whichever of the largest of the two will become the female it will develop ovaries and the ability to develop eggs and it will grow larger in size. And it turns out that in a pair of clownfish, if there is a male and a female and they successfully pair bond and breed for years on end, if the female is lost, uh, that male may form a new pair bond with another clownfish. And it could be that the previously male fish would then, uh, potentially turn into the female and develop uh, ovaries and begin depositing eggs. So it's a type of hermaphrodism that's not incredibly peculiar in the animal uh, kingdom, but they're not just uh, sexually, uh, like sexually binary and not able to uh, make changes. So that's the deal in these clownfish that are born and live all together they will just stay in a big clutch like this and none of them will pair off um, in order for them to pair off they kind of need their own area they need a separate space and it needs to be kind of isolated from the rest so you can actually keep like a hundred clownfish all living together all in a big like school and they will probably never uh, never spawn because there would never be like a separate pair. But as soon as you pull two out and put them in a separate tank and give them a separate place or give them a separate place in the ocean, uh, then they will pair bond. I mean, if they pair bond, then they'll pair bond and uh, one will be male, one will be female. And then that's, that's like how that goes. Okay, so I posted videos of other types of clownfish because besides the uh, Osolaris clownfish, we also had a pair of pink skunk clownfish that were known uh, fish from another breeder. It's actually a friend of mine had them and they laid eggs in the tank regularly. They're called pink skunk clownfish because well, they're pink in color instead of orange. And then they have a big white stripe down their back. That's what they called skunk clownfish. And they laid eggs regularly and they had huge clutches of eggs, like 1500 eggs, it was unbelievable but their babies were very, very small and very difficult to raise. So I was only able to ever raise like maybe 50 out of like a thousand uh, successfully. But uh, they were very prolific, but they were really old. When I got them, they were already 10 years old and we had them for like about another three or four years. Um, 
But here's the thing about those. I could never train them to lay on a tile. So there's another method to get the babies out of the tank. So there's a, a guy who invented this uh, larva trap. His name is Fawson. Uh, I've met him at conferences before. And this is these are pink skunk clownfish in a Vossen larva trap. And how the trap works is there's an air line on this side and the air line makes bubbles and the bubbles rise up in this side of the trap. And as the bubbles rise up, it draws water up this side. So what happens is fish will swim near the bottom of the trap and the water is flowing up this part. It comes down here and then into this section and then it forms like a little like circulation pattern. And the water goes out through the screen, this mesh. This is like a mesh here. Um, this little white thing is actually a little tiny light. So I mentioned that clownfish are attracted to light. So once the fish hatch in the tank, you put this trap in, set up the air stone, put this little light here, and the fish swim toward this light and get kind of sucked up in the trap. And that was pretty successful. So these are all pink skunk clowns that I've trapped in the larva trap. Unfortunately, it's not you're not able to get all the fish out of the tank with this method. And because they have to spin around in here as you're trapping them for like about an hour or so, uh, they don't get to eat for that hour because you're not also feeding them. And as they kind of take this roller coaster ride, it can do damage to them because they're very, very, very like, uh, you know, very fragile, they're extremely fragile fish. So you can see stuff about the uh, pink skunk clownfish that we used to have too. So there's pink skunk uh, spawning, the larva trap, 24 day old, and then seven day old ones. I don't remember how long or how many are in this, but yeah, these are like ones that are weak and it looks like, you know, there might be 50, like 20 to 50 of them. That was about all that I could get out of like the thousand because uh, those babies were when they were born, they were almost out of energy. They almost had like no yolk sac at all. It was really hard for them to survive. So anyway, that's about clownfish. And that's what we do with clownfish. And if this were a regular school year, uh, I probably would have raised some clownfish and we would have done that throughout the semester. Um, if I, I have a pair of clownfish that still lays eggs regularly and uh, I'll pay attention this week to see what day they lay them and uh, take some pictures and video. And then when we come back, like if we come back, I don't know, I don't know. But if we come back, you'll be able to see the clownfish. But you can also always stop by in future semesters or future years and be like, hey, do you have any baby clownfish? Because seeing the baby clowns is a pretty amazing thing too. All right, so that's what I had for you today. Hopefully that was informative. Hopefully the sound sounded okay. But if you wanna see the videos a lot better, you can see them there. Those are, it took me a while because I have like all kinds of fish videos all over my YouTube channel. And I had to find all those and catalog them, but now they're all kind of in one place for you to see. Those are in the plan for the week. So that's that. If you don't have any questions, uh, you can go to your next class. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat, turn on your mic, whatever you want to do. Otherwise, hopefully your break was great. We'll catch you tomorrow.